and he just beat the shit out of me for an hour. Right, and I remember feeling sick because I'm rolling around and my body's not used to being upside and I, I'm, I'm dizzy. And, but at the end of it, you know, I'm breathing heavy and I've just had a fight with this guy and I'm like, I love this. Like, I thought this was gone from my life forever and you've given me this gift back. So I'm like, right, let's, let me ask you some questions. So we started like digging into it and I said, right, show me this technique. Can I adapt it? And he would, we would, we didn't know, there was nothing set, right? We had to figure it all out as we went. But he's like, yeah, you can do this. And then I was putting like a, a cross collar choke on him or an arm bar. And I'm like, so this isn't going to be based on sympathy and pity. I've actually got to put the work in here. And not only have I got to put the work in, I've got to take what 99% of people that do this sport do and then figure out how I can do it. This is going to be very difficult to get me out of here yeah. because I'm in a 12 foot crater on a high piece of ground surrounded by other IEDs. I'm probably going to die. Welcome to the Drop In with Pindy podcast from Warriors TMA Academy, a podcast for everyone, from business inspirational leaders, combat sports enthusiasts, martial artists, and fitness fans. Together, we can build our self-discipline, confidence, and positive mindsets through great leaders. Now, here's your host, coach, and former pro fighter, Pindy Matahar. Welcome everyone here for another episode of a Dropping with Pindy podcast. Today I am honoured to be sat in front of Mark, everyone who has travelled all the way from Plymouth to come here in Coventry to film this podcast. And it's someone that I've been, we've been messaging each other back and forth to try and get this nailed down and get this date in the diary because you've got one hell of an incredible inspirational story, which I know all of our listeners today are going to be leaving today's podcast or after listening to it being like, wow, what's our excuse? Mm. Uh, And we get all those petty excuses of not being able to do certain things, but you're a living proof out there to show everyone that it's always possible. There's always possibility. Mm -hmm. You just got to have the mindset behind it um, of achieving anything you want to achieve. Um, I know your story is in, absolutely incredible from going from where you were in the early 2000s to mid and then now now what you've achieved the most recently becoming MBE is just phenomenal mm. so mark first of all thank you so much for coming all this way to do this amazing podcast with us and tell us man how did it all start how was it how's the journey be man it has been uh a roller coaster uh like I think most of it was lives, to be fair. You know, lots of ups and lots of downs, but the whole thing, I'll I'll go right back to the beginning. You know, the the journey really started for me probably when I was about 15 and a half. Right. Um, Coming up to the end of compulsory education, Mm -hmm. exams on the horizon, and you have choices to make, right? You know, when you finish these exams, if you do well enough, do you go to college, to uni and, and pursue that path? Or do you just jump ship at 16 and, and start a career or a job in the big bad world? Now, when I was growing up, all of my friends that I grew up with were, we all went, most of us went to the same school, yeah. but they were all like two or three years older than I was. So when I was 15 and a half, they'd already left school and started on their individual pathways. Some went to uni, uh-huh. Some started jobs as civilians, but a lot of my friends went in the military, in, in all, all the branches. Right. So when I got to that point, and I'm trying to figure out what route I want to take, I, I looked at these guys, and they seemed to always have money. Whenever they came back, they were always partying. They always had new cars. They were always telling me these stories about, you know, these fitness tests that they were they were put through, these yeah. grueling endurance tests or all these cool weapons that they got to fire. I had friends who used to drive tanks and blow stuff up with tanks. And, you know, I'm sat there trying to figure out what I'm going to do in my life. And I'm like, well, you know what? I think the military is the right choice for me. And, and in my gut, it felt right as well. Yeah. So I went down to the careers office before I left school with my friend who was in the army, mm-hmm. spoke to the recruiter, got the paperwork, took it home and because of my age I had to get parental consent because I was too young to just make that choice on my own and my dad 
told me that I had an uncle who was in the Royal Marines. Because initially what I did, I got the paperwork for the army. Because right. that's all I knew. I just thought if you want to be a soldier, that's what you do. You go in the army. I didn't know much about any of the other areas right. in the armed forces. So he told me I had an uncle who was a Royal Marine. And he didn't live that far from me, like 25, 35 minutes. So we hopped in a car one morning, went to see him. And I'll I never forget, he lived on like a, a converted farm. And he had horses and this huge Alsatian dog. And it reminded me of like the opening scene of Commando when they live out in the middle of nowhere yeah. and he's walking with the tree trunk on his shoulder. Yeah. And I, I remember opening the front door to this barn conversion. And uh, as you walked in the living room, there was this huge framed citation on the wall. Mm. And it had this big like silver chrome like sword on top of it with a green beret hanging on the end. And uh, my uncle had gone, he joined the Marines as a Marine, which is our equivalent of a private. Right. And over his 22 year career, he climbed the ladder and left as a captain. So the sword is like an officer's sword. The Green Beret is the symbol of being a Royal Marines commando. And the citation was like what he'd got to summarize his career, the last yeah. 22 years of his life. And he told me about his career and the things that he had done and he'd experienced and the kind of things I could expect to experience if I took that path and went down that road. And I left and I, I just remember thinking, this is what I want to do. Yeah. So I went back to the career center. This time I spoke to the Royal Marines recruiter. And this is back in the day when they had VHS cassettes. So there was no streaming or Netflix. Oh, wow. And they had the TV video combi. You put the cassette yeah. in. And I just watched these guys, you know, doing what looked like incredible things. You know, the Royal yeah. Marines are trained to operate in any environment in the world so there were guys skiing with these huge packs on they were jumping out of helicopters they were in the jungle up to their chest in water patrolling through the through the jungle and wow. they were in the desert training they they had speed boats like assaulting beaches and i'm just like wow how did i not know who these guys are even i didn't know that right yeah that, that's that, and i just saw it and then you know that video combined with what my uncle had told me i was like right this is what i need to do right and I was very aware, even at that young age, that the training it is arguably the longest and hardest in the world for regular forces. You know, special forces is very different. But I knew it was going to be unbelievably difficult for me. Yeah. But it's all I wanted to do. Like, even now talking about it, I'm getting goosebumps. And I just remember thinking, this is it. You know, my heart, my mind and my gut was like, this is what you need to do. This is where you're going to be happy. So I applied. And back then you had to do like a three-day beat-up course. It was called the Potential Royal Marines course yeah. where you go and just get thrashed for three days. Um, and it's an opportunity for you as an individual mm -hmm. to decide, is this the life I want to live? And it's an opportunity for the people training you over those three days to look at you and say, is he ready? Yeah. Now, I was very fortunate that I passed that first time. I didn't get any injuries, um, managed to meet the standards that they set. Yeah. Went home with a training program and that's all I did. You know, I quickly finished up school and I did pretty well. You know, I got 10 GCSEs, nine oh, wow. A to Cs, only one D. So I could have gone on to college, could have gone on to university, but my mind was made up yeah. and my heart was set on seeing if I had what it took to pass this training. So I stuck to their training program they gave me to the letter. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to start and progressively build up to yeah. running in boots, putting weight on and all that kind of stuff. And then the letter eventually came that said, we'd like to invite you to start Royal Marine training in February 2001. Here's your kit list. Hope you've been keeping to the training program. See you soon. Wow. Um, and that was it. You know, I, I carried on with the training, went and got all the kit that I needed got on that train and uh, set sail for what I thought was going to be a a 22 year career if I could pass the training. So yeah, straight straight out of school, mate. Um, nothing else really was on my radar. Yeah, and no, yeah, nothing else apart from apart from this. No plan B. No, it was like this or nothing. And I, I honestly, if I'd had failed or I'd had quitted, I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. And that, that's actually, when I look back on it, quite, quite powerful. Because everyone says, you know, have a backup plan. You've got to have a plan B in case plan A doesn't work. But actually, if you don't have a plan B, 
it motivates you to make plan a work absolutely absolutely you hear, i hear this a lot with um obviously as you know with this podcast we have a lot of athletes here we recently mm. had brolia here obviously someone that we both know really well mm -hmm. and his mindset very similar in terms of his his jiu-jitsu career when he was a young kid in in, in brazil obviously wanted to pursue that there was no plan B right. there, and it's to say, it mm. sounds very similar to you with this. There was no plan B. You had one, one mindset and you've got that one mindset, tunnel vision. That's where mm -hmm. you're going nowhere yep. else. There's no distractions going left or right, straight down. And it, and it really, really helps because you know, when you, if you can go through Royal Marines training in one go, mm. it, it back in the day, it was 30 weeks. I think it's 32 weeks now. When you factor in Easter leave, Christmas leave, summer leave, yeah. if you can do it in one go, you meet the standards at every checkpoint and you don't get injured. It's the best part of a year. So throughout that time, it's pretty miserable and you want to quit all the time. And I always remember, and I did like almost every day felt like quitting. Cause the funny thing is the, where we do our training in Limston is like 45 minutes from where I grew up and where I live. So it just felt like get on that train and I could be home in a heartbeat and have this lovely, comfortable life again. But I always kind of looked forward and thought to myself, the minute I'm sat on that train, yeah. the minute it pulls away from the station, because they've got their own independent train station, which is right, right by the assault course, okay. the minute I leave, I'll regret it. And so I, I got so close numerous times to being like, oh, I'm done, I can't do this. But I just imagined myself sat on the train watching me leaving, going, I've made a mistake and I want to stop and go back and, and keep going, but it's too late then. Yeah. And so that was powerful too. Like no plan B, imagining myself on that train, like I can't do it. I've just got to stick this out, you know, and just put one foot in front of the other and continue until eventually I'll get there. Yeah. And that's what I did. Talk, talk to us about some of the training regimes that they made you, that, that, that they put you through. Because I've heard like some of the training is absolutely grueling. Mm. Like I, we've been in fight camps, but that, that goes nowhere near compared to some of the stuff that you, got, you guys went through during that time. Yeah. Yeah, it is brutal, like, you yeah. know, and I was, I was 17 years old. I was still a boy. I was the second youngest in my troop, 64 men to begin with that came from all over the world. So even just being in that environment mm -hmm. for me was really overwhelming and, and scary. Yeah. But they they put you through the ringer, like physically and, and mentally and emotionally. And one of the things that really stood out for me was, yes, you have to be fit. Mm -hmm. You have to be physically fit. But it's, it's very progressive, the yeah. way they build you and build you and build you till you get to the end of training when you've got the commando test to do. Yeah. But what I saw throughout training was men a lot fitter than me quitting because they couldn't handle being wet. They couldn't handle being cold. They couldn't handle being hungry. They couldn't handle being sleep deprived for day after day after day when you are you know, you've got these big heavy packs on and yeah. you're out on exercise and you're, you're yomping, which is basically walking with right. stupid weight on your back over undulating terrain, Dartmoor and these kind of places for days and days and days with blisters and, you know, trying to live in the field is what we call it. You know, brushing your teeth at four in the morning when it's raining, shaving with cold water, eating ration packs for five, six, seven days. They didn't like that part of it. They were way fitter than I was. And when it came to running assault courses and stuff, they'd, they'd whip me. Yeah, But I could find the funny side in being wet and cold and, and just shivering at three o'clock in the oh, morning oh sat there God. wet but they would break you know and and that's when i understood that it was actually a mental game as well and you yeah. have to build your mental toughness up and that's what separates the raw marines from a lot of the, the other outfits yeah. is that mental resilience i didn't know it at the time you know but looking back I realized it's that's what it was. Clearly that, yeah, it's yeah. clearly that's mental strength. Yeah, and I get a lot of people contact me uh, through Instagram and things and they're like, have you got any tips for training? You know, what's my fitness regime got to be like? And I'm like, look, I don't know. Like, I'm not an expert on that yeah. and I wouldn't tell you anything because there are people in the military, in the Royal Marines that will give you exactly what you need to do. So just stick to that to the letter. What I will say is figure out a way to work on your mental toughness. If that means jumping in the sea every morning at four o'clock in three degree water for 20 minutes, do it. As long as it's safe, do it. Do yeah. things that make you feel uncomfortable and push you and that make you miserable because the more you can condition yourself to put up with those rubbish environments, the better you're going to be able to handle them because they are going to be there. They are coming. There's no escaping it. Yeah. You've got to go through it. And that's, that's what I just say to them. Figure out a way to be mentally tougher.
That's awesome. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And mm. I think some of like the guys listening to this and the girls listening to this that are that are going into the combat sport route or they're mm. going into that. I think that's the biggest part because like you said, there's gonna be people out there physically tougher and physically mm-hmm. fitter, but all it takes is this to break and then boom. Yeah. And then yeah. you you've you've got it. And the the mental game in, in combat sport as well for us is 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 huge. Yeah. Um Ours is a sport. Yours is real life. Does that, mm. does that make sense? It's like absolutely. But there, there are similarities though. Because mm. we were talking briefly before we started here and, and I used to compete in Muay Thai, yeah. full contact kickboxing and boxing. So I've, in combat sport, not to any great level, yeah. but I've been to those places where you need to dig a little deeper. You've, you've, you've gassed out you're miserable because someone's just punching or kicking the hell out of you and they're knocking you down and, and inside even if you're a big, tough, hairy alpha male, you're yeah. like, I just want to go home. Yeah. And you've got to dig deeper and overcome it. And it's very similar to being in military combat yeah. when bullets are coming your way and you have that same kind of feeling and you've got to go inside yourself and go like, right, I need to overcome this somehow and figure this out and, and be stronger and be br- and inside, even though you, you feel like a little boy, yeah. you need to be a man and, and just push and forward push. with it. And yeah. that's a similarity that I've drawn, drawn from a war scenario to a, a combat scenario in, yeah. in sport, you, the, the feelings are the same. Do you know what I mean? Of course, of yeah. course. You know? yeah. So obviously you've gone through all this training, you've, you've, you've just proven that mentally you're a lot stronger than some of the guys out there on the, on the field with you. You got the first call up to go to Afghanistan is early 2000s. And mm. what would just tell me that, that, mental state you were in getting that call you have to go out there the, the brush <laughs> all of that man yeah so i finished my training in october 2001 started yeah. in february finished in october four weeks after 9 11 so i remember we were doing all the we done all the physical side of it right yeah. and we're just doing all the marching and getting ready for the big pass out parade and we we're all in a diner and i remember watching it on tv and i was 18 years old and you're done when you're 18 right and it was like that scene in Jarhead, the movie. And everyone's like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah. We didn't have a clue what the realities of, of it were. We didn't have a clue about the politics or any of that yeah. stuff. We were just like, yeah, we've trained, let's go. Young men. Right, yeah. keen to see yeah. if what... I, I, was, I just remember thinking, like, I've been through all this training and all these people that have trained me for the last year have told me how great we are, how elite we are, how good we are at our job. And so I just remember thinking... I want to see if that's true. If if yeah. I am at yeah. this level as an 18 year, I'm still a boy. Can I do this job that I'm trained to do? Yeah. So the thought of going to combat so early was quite exciting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I did. I, I trained straight away in January 2002 to go to Afghanistan on Operation Jakana. Didn't go in the end. I'm not sure what happened, but they really scaled it back. Okay. So I felt a little bit disappointed, but then I settled into what we call unit life just in the UK. And I started doing some of the things I saw in that recruiting video. So I went to Norway. I learned to fight and survive in the Arctic. And I went a couple of times. I went down to America and did some exercises with allied troops. Uh, That's when I started boxing. I boxed as a heavyweight in the Marines. Lost the heavyweight funnel at one point. I was so devastated. Um, But then 2003 came around and Iraq became our focus. Okay. So I started training pre-deployment training for a tour of Iraq. And then this time I actually did deploy. I turned 19 at this point and I deployed an Operation Telic 1, which was that initial push over the Kuwaiti Iraqi border into Iraq. Um, and I spent three and a half months in a place called Umkazar. Right. A lot of my friends pushed up to the palace and the oil fields in these places, but I kind of ended up more southerly than that. Okay. And uh, didn't really see anything. You know, I, I I volunteered to be a quick reaction force for a field hospital in the area to protect ambulances and medics because I thought maybe I'll see something yeah. if I'm working with those guys. But nothing. Like three and a half months passed. Um, you know, I saw stuff from a distance, but nothing up close. Yeah. And I came back and I was like, what was that? You know what yeah, I mean? I've, yeah, I've been yeah. done all this training and all these people have told me I'm this elite soldier and I've been to war. I didn't really feel like an elite soldier. I didn't see anything what I assumed an elite soldier would see. So I came back a little bit like, oh, okay, yeah. um, box ticked. Now what? Yeah. I've got 20 years ahead of me 
Um, no, I'll just think? see what happens. And yeah, just settle back into into unit life again and just waited for whatever was next. Fair mm. play, fair play. And then obviously you've come back, you carried on training, then you got called again, is that right? You get called out to in 2006, seven. seven well, I, I left for a year actually after my minimum five years because yeah. I had finished training, experienced combat, did a few extra things. I thought, you know, I've ticked a lot of boxes in those first five years. Yeah. I'm going to leave now. And I retrained as a bodyguard. I went to South Africa, uh, did six weeks out there, came back. I was working as a nightclub doorman while I was trying to get work in the bodyguarding world. Okay. And it wasn't for the lack of work because there was a lot of it. But I, I think I was 21 at the time and I didn't know anybody in that world. Yeah. And I, I just struggled to get any work. As a, uh, as bodyguard? As a bodyguard. So after like 11 or 12 months... I decided that it wasn't going to happen. So I went back to the Royal Marines. Wow. And because I'd only been a civilian for a year, there was no need to do all the training again. Okay. You just do annual tests, like right. fitness, shooting, weapons handling, that kind of stuff. And I was back in within like three weeks. Fruit. Back in uniform after a year out, what, ready to start again. What made you want to go into body, bodyguarding? It just seemed it seemed glamorous. Oh, I'm not yeah. gonna lie. I yeah, just thought, I thought I'd that? just be like looking yeah. after A-list celebrities in London, living this great life with these great stories, earning loads of money. Yeah. And uh, actually, it's, it's quite a funny story. The first day of the the course in South Africa, they do the fitness tests. Right. And they weren't particularly difficult, but when you finish them and you know you're out of breath and a bit fatigued, they take you into a classroom, and they have these little squares masking taped on the floor. And they make everyone stand in a square. And they're like, right, stay here. We'll be back in a minute. We're not going to be long. Anyone leaves the square, you fail the course. So you stand in this square and you're like still recovering. You literally come off yeah. a run. You're like, ah, ah, you're breathing. Eight hours later, they came back, right? What they did was they put a camera. You know those, like the things you have in your house that spurt a scent out every like hour? Yeah, 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 yeah. So they had taken the scent out of it and put a camera in there. And they were watching us all for eight hours to make sure no one stepped out of the box. So I think two people did, and they were kicked off the course. And they came in and they said, if you think bodyguarding is about looking after celebrities, going to the Grammys and having this glamorous yeah. life, it isn't. So this is the commercial side of it. You stand in a little square outside a hotel room while there's a celebrity in there sleeping or having a meeting or for eight, nine hours at a time, changing over your buddies. And this is about as glamorous as it gets. And I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> like at least you're wow. honest with us. That is all, I on the, never, on the first never thought of that. I yeah, because a lot of the that. time you just, you are, unless you, you're established in that world and yeah. you're really good at it, when you're getting into it, you're just going to be stood outside a hotel room, like probably getting treated badly by someone, yeah. you know, talked down to, or you do the other side of it, which is going back to Iraq, Afghanistan, yeah. somewhere, living out of a backpack for six months at a time, and then coming home for six months. So they dispelled all those myths straight away. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I couldn't get work in the industry. So I went back to the Royal Marines yeah. uh, early 2007, where I was going to pick up my career and um, this time around mm -hmm. have a plan. Yeah. Because I spent the first five years just having fun. Do you know what I mean? Doing what a young Royal Marine would do. And uh, after that failure as a civilian, I thought I've got to plan my career now, put some structure on it and have some goals right. and start building my own career and taking responsibility. So that's what I did. I went back with a plan straight into pre-deployment training though, because Afghanistan was, was our next focus. Right. And then deployed there September, 2007. That's when it, mm -hmm. that's when it happened. That's when it happened. Yeah. Well, it was, can you remember it all or is it, is it oh, absolutely, yeah. every, every, yeah, yeah. I, rem I remember it all, mate. Um, so we go out, we, when we were in Afghanistan, these were six-month tours we were doing. Yeah. So, you know, the plan was to be there for six months, but halfway through my tour, it was it was actually Christmas Eve, 2007, I was second in command of a group of eight men that were out on a routine foot patrol. Okay. And on the way back in, we were given what we call overwatch, which is like protection for another group that we were with, that we left with earlier in the day. And uh, I was the last man to take my fire position. Right. And as I did, I went to get on my stomach and I put my right knee on the floor and I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device, which instantly ripped off uh, both my legs 
above the knee and my my right arm above the elbow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, and the funny, you know, the tour, the three months prior to that, you know, we had been out on loads of these patrols. We had come into contact with the enemy loads of times. We were having a very successful tour. We were bringing a lot of a value to the the civilians that lived in the area and yeah. doing our best to help as many as we could. So things were great to that point and we hadn't even sustained one casualty in three months. And so the first one that we do get is me and it's like the most the severe word, thing yeah. that you could think of. You know, stand on an IED, lose three limbs. We were on uh, a high piece of ground whilst yeah. um, I was injured and the IED, there, there were six of these things that were scattered around us. Uh -huh. It had created a 12 foot by 15 foot crater. I had six devices around me and I'm on high ground. So when you think of that from an evacuation point of view, it's probably the most difficult scenario you could be in. And I remember after, you know, probably about 10 seconds, I figured out what had gone on because I thought we were under attack to begin with. Right. Uh, this huge dust cloud that was created had disappeared and I could see what had happened to me. It's very bizarre because there's no pain. You almost feel like you're dreaming and it's very difficult to process. Yeah. So I know I'm saying it quite like blase, like, oh yeah, they ripped my legs off, yeah, did this, did that. Yeah. But it, the, it's a very, very weird experience, like very surreal. There's no pain. You can't understand what's going on. And bizarrely, at some point you feel very relaxed, which you wouldn't, imagine you would feel like there's 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 panic and there's a, there's a bit of worry mm -hmm. but i just remember feeling kind of spaced out but also relaxed but thinking to myself this is going to be very difficult to get me out of here yeah because i'm in a 12 foot crater on a high piece of ground surrounded by other ieds i'm probably going to die but bizarrely in, in the back of my mind Although I was thinking that consciously, I think subconsciously, I was like, no, I'm not. Because I know that these guys that I'm with yeah. are going to do whatever it takes to get me out of there. They they will not let me die. Yeah. And they'll do whatever it takes. And that's exactly what they did. And it's, it's this sounds really backwards, right? Yeah. But we're trained in that situation. The other seven men are trained not to get emotional. So you imagine you see your friend hurt Mm -hmm. dying the first thing you want to do is run in and save him we're trained not to do that in case you set off other devices which could hurt or kill you or further hurt and kill the casualty so you have to override every human emotion that you have and just be professional right and that's what they did you know one of the guys was straight on the radio mm -hmm. calling in an evacuation had a 19 year old on his stomach with a bayonet prodding the ground marking out a safe route for when the medic could get to me okay I had another guy coordinating all around defense because there's the risk of a small arms attack follow up where guys will come with, with AKs or whatever and, yeah. and take everybody out. So you have to keep defensive and they did it all perfectly. Wow. You know, it's funny because you mess it up, I guess, like in any of this, when you're yeah, drilling course, things, you mess it up nine times out of 10. Yeah. But when you need to do it in They're a scenario right. like that, or if you're in a title fight or whatever, and it, you need to do it, something takes over right and it just mm. you just do it like autonomously and they did everything perfectly and they they got in there the medic got to me very quickly gave me morphine put tourniquets on my limbs put me on a stretcher my right leg and my my right arm were my left one was completely gone the, right. the right one was still kind of hanging on by like a tendon okay my right arm was still hanging on with some muscle and flesh so they had to kind of scoop up those parts and put them on my stomach right to put me on a stretcher they then i could, don't could you see could we, yeah could yeah yeah it was all just lying on my stomach like a boot with a foot in it with flesh hanging out of it and my so arm was just trashed um and they got me off this high feature somehow i no, i closed my eyes at this point when they took me off because i just remember thinking there's no way they're going to be able to get me down off this because this this is like the footing's very loose and you could slip and drop me and throw me off this high feature and, you know, all sorts of bad scenarios yeah. could happen. But they got me off there. They put me in the back of a vehicle and then the vehicle started driving to get to where the helicopter was going to meet us. Okay. And as it started going up this incline, it was going to go into 
the like front entrance of our camp. It's a helicopter landing site. So it was in the middle of our camp. And the, the guy driving, you have to be quite aggressive at certain because the roads are like sand and dust and yeah. big holes and loose footing. You have to be quite aggressive or else the, the ground was going to crumble underneath right. you. Right. And he got to a point where he had to hit the accelerator, steer in one direction. And it was very, very bumpy. And as he did that, the medic that had saved me fell out the back. Oh, man. Now I went to fall out after him. And as the bottom of my back hit the tailgate of the vehicle, the driver swung round, kind of reached out, grabbed what he could grab to hold me in the vehicle and ended up grabbing the femur bone that was coming up my right leg um, to hold me in. Now, he left the medic to, to roll down the hill, <laughs> but there was the other group of men that we went out with earlier. They were at the bottom of the hill, so there's eight heavily armed men, so he was safe. And he got me to the helicopter landing site and the last thing I remember of the whole thing was this this Chinook landing, the sandstorm that's created from the propeller blades and the heat from the exhaust beating down on me in the back of this vehicle. And then I blacked out and later found out, because I've met the, the entire medical yeah. team since, that they had, they had classed me as clinically dead. Um, wow. And I died. That's the blackout. Mm -hmm. I blacked out. It's the last thing I remember of, of that incident. Yeah. And because um, I've met them since, they said, yeah, we, we put you on the helicopter. Yeah. And you were dead. So now I don't remember any of this. Yeah. But, but what they tell me happened was that, so there was another casualty in, yeah. in the blast, but he had just got shrapnel in it. I say just got, he had yeah. sustained shrapnel injuries to his back and his tricep. Right. Now, the way you prioritize a casualty in this scenario, in a, in a wartime scenario, is if you've got a guy who's dead and a guy that's dying, as harsh as it sounds, you leave the dead guy because you want to put all your attention on the dying guy because you don't want two dead guys. Of course. So they, they tried feeling me for a pulse and they said I didn't have one. They tried putting intravenous lines into me to give me fluids, but all my veins had collapsed because of the blood loss. And then when they put an oxygen mask on me, it should have steamed up to show that I was breathing, but it didn't. So they said, like, this dude's dead, leave him. Let's go work on him. All right. Now, as one of the medics walked past me to get some equipment to go and work back on the other casualty, he said that my eyes started to flutter, which meant to him that my heart was still beating. So he alerted some of the other medics. They came over and got to work on me. And three days before I was injured, whoever is in charge of, like, the army medical world had given the green light for this new technique to be used where if you can't get intravenous lines into somebody's veins, yeah. you can drill into their tibia and their fibia and you can administer fluids that way. And then the problem was I didn't have a tibia or a fibia. They'd both been destroyed yeah. by these IEDs. So the two medics that were working on me very bravely made a decision that they were going to try and drill into my hip bone and see if they could administer fluids that way, which they did. Uh, the first time it failed because they, they didn't put the skin tight enough, they said. Okay. So they, they corrected that, tightened the skin, went back in, one drilled in the front, one in the back. They put intravenous lines in and they said the f within like three minutes, I was awake, responsive, wow. and coherently answering questions. That, that they were, I don't remember any of this, but they said I, that I was answering their questions. Yeah. And apparently the first thing I said was that my ass really hurt, which... They, they tell me it's a side effect of mass amounts of morphine. So they were like, brilliant. That's a good sign. Okay. We know, we know he's going to make it. He's going to be okay because that's what's supposed to happen. And then they flew me back to a place called Camp Bastion. They took me to the field hospital and the surgeons had a look at the damage okay. that had been caused to my limbs. And they decided the only way they're going to save me is if they took off both my legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow. And, that, and then that was that. That was it. They, they did that. They stabilized me, they bandaged me up, and then they flew me to uh, Birmingham, to Selly Oak Hospital, where I arrived at about four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. Oh. Mm -hmm. So this is all within the 24 hour? Yeah, yeah. 24? I mean, it, there's wow. a time difference between, I don't know what it is yeah, between course, the UK and Afghanistan, but yeah, injured on about lunchtime Christmas Eve and back in the UK, the following four or five in the morning on Christmas Day. Holy crap. Mm-hmm. I was, the way you were telling me the story, I was expecting it to be, this is a couple, like a 
No. 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 Wow. Straight back in. And then, you know, I was unconscious for three days. Yeah. I woke up very briefly on the 28th of December. Um, Not like disorientated or anything like you'd expect, like freaking out or panicking. I, I just remember lying in this, this bed and I could, I couldn't open my eyes. I, I was just like, why? Just imagine the most exhausted you've ever been and then times it by a thousand. And I think that's because I had infections. I was on pain relief. I was on drugs. I just, I was lying there trying to summon every ounce of strength I had to open my eyes and I couldn't do it. But I could kind of see the blurry outlines of the ceiling lights mm -hmm. and I could hear everyone around me. Um, and I think because of the drugs I was on, everything was echoing. But I kind of, it's bizarre. I kind of knew that I was safe. Yeah. And I, I knew... I knew I'd been injured, but I knew I was safe. Yeah. And uh, that was quite reassuring for me. And I woke up very briefly. I actually proposed to my wife in like 15 seconds of consciousness. Even though I couldn't speak, I was mumbling and whispering. And she said, did you propose to me? And I kind of smiled and then just passed back out. Um, and then they brought me out of the drug-induced coma the next day. Yeah. And over the, the course of that week, so the other four days, they gradually reduced my medication to bring me out of a drug-induced coma, but where I wasn't in a lot of pain, so I could understand fully what it was that had happened to me um, and try and deal with it and try and figure out what I was going to do, you know, so. What was your first memory? Uh, you said, I know you said you blacked out, obviously, being in the back of that, not an ambulance, but the back of that in vehicle. The helicopter, yeah. Um, what was your first memory of, of being awake and understanding what's actually happened to you? It was probably day seven. Day seven. And it, it's funny, right? Because, and I, I say this all the time, I don't know if it was done by design or whether it was just luck, but the way they weaned me off the medication in that first week in Selyoke, by day seven, I was able to fully understand my situation. But it, it was like it was drip fed to me day by day. So it wasn't too much information to handle in one hit. And I, I remember initially waking up thinking I'd lost my feet and some fingers on my right arm. And then the next day, you know, I figured out it was more than my feet. And then, you know, by day seven, I pulled my arm out from under the bed sheet. Now, when I was on this pain relief and these drugs, I was hallucinating a lot. So I like, you remember Will Smith in The Fresh Prince? Yeah. When he had that high and tight haircut? Yeah. So like three Will Smiths came to visit me and one had a small haircut, one was medium, one was, was huge like kid in play. And I was just like hanging out with Will Smith one day in my room, just hallucinating. <laughs> I had this giant bottle of ketchup in my room and yeah. a forklift truck was driving around at one point. So by day seven, I pulled my arm out from under the sheet and I kind of giggled a little bit. And the nurse was like, what, what are you laughing what? at? I said, oh, I'm still hallucinating. It looks like my arm's falling off because I thought I'd just lost some fingers. And she looked at me with that look as if to say, how am I supposed to tell him? Uh, and she didn't need to tell me anything. And I kind of understood that I'm, I'm not hallucinating. My right arm, I haven't lost fingers. I've lost my entire arm. Yeah. Now I knew, like it was both legs above the knee, right arm above the elbow. Okay, I'm fully aware now. Um, You know, we're good to go. I, yeah. I understand. And so they took me out of intensive care after that week. They moved me up to the S4 ward, the Barnes and Plastics ward to a high dependency room. And that was where I was to start the long road to recovery. Wow. Mm. And I know uh, we, we keep referring back to your mental strength. Um, we know how, how strong you are in that, in that sense. But anyone else would have gave up from that point, in my opinion. Um, I've, heard, I've heard stories before, but like you've pursued on to achieve multiple things. You've pursued on to keep on going. Look where you're at at the moment. Mm. But... You said, obviously, you come out of consciousness, mumbled and proposed to your wife, which is amazing mm -hmm. news. Went back out again. But <sighs> explain to me your mindset, your, 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 your vision as what you wanted to do and how you're going to do it and all of it. Because obviously, as a triple amputee, it's, mm -hmm. there's only so much physicality you can do. Obviously, did you, when did you get the... The prosthetics. Yeah, when, like was was that that wasn't straight away, was it, or was it? Or? No, I, I did six weeks in total in hospital. Then I moved to a place called Headley Court in mm -hmm. Surrey, and that was where I was eventually to be issued with the prosthetics. Yeah, but um, 
the whole mindset thing, it sounds really corny, right? But I was I was born in the 80s, grew up in the 90s, big Arnie, Stallone, Van Damme fan, loved it all. That's what got me yeah. into martial arts when I was a okay. chubby teenager. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I always remember watching those movies and, and loving like the hero taking the fall and then the climb back. Like you can you can watch Rocky now and even just thinking about it gives me goosebumps yeah. and all these movies. I still watch Rocky now. Just I know, it, man. Like I know. But yeah. I just... That's how I saw myself when I was yeah. going through Royal Marines training, like as the guy that never gives up, the guy that's always fighting against the odds, the guy that always overcomes it and figures it out. And when I was in rehab, that in hospital, in the early parts, that's kind of what my mindset was. It's like, here's this big challenge in front of me. Is This is my Ivan Drago. What have I got to do to mm -hmm. beat it? And the Royal Marines as well, we, we've got a very proud history yeah. right? and loads yeah. of battle honors and, when I was in hospital, I remember there's not much you can do, right? When you're lying in the bed, I only had the use of two fingers because my entire left palm was cut open from shrapnel. So you got a lot of time to think and you can't sleep very well because of the medication. You're up at all hours. And I was thinking about the history of the Royal Marines. I think they were 347 years old at, the, at that time. And I remember thinking, there's nobody I've ever heard of within that whole 347 years that was remembered for letting the side down and giving up and quitting. Like everyone always lived up to the standards that were setting them in Royal Marine training. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, all I've got to do really is take the standards, the values and the ethos that I had drilled into me when I was trained to be a Marine and apply them to my rehab. And I thought, I'm not going to be that guy when I get to rehab. And I'd never worked in a tri-service environment before. I'd never really worked with the Army or the Navy because the Royal Marines are very much... You know, it's male only. You're always around other guys like that. They're always at the highest standard. But everyone outside of that world knows what it takes to be a Royal Marine. So yeah. I thought when I go to rehab and I'm surrounded by the RAF, the Navy, the Army, and all these other people, I'm going to show them what yeah. being a Royal Marine is about. And it doesn't just mean you can run the fastest, lift the most, you know, do the, the most soldier and whatever it is. It's a mindset that you can apply to every area of your life and every challenge in your life. And this is my biggest challenge now. I've just got to apply that mindset to this and this is how I'm going to overcome it. That's amazing. And that's, that's what I that's did, man. Amazing. That's amazing. That's incredible. What I, did. I just got there and the first day I got there, I set myself a goal. Yeah. My, my unit was still deployed. They still had eight weeks left of their tour. They were going to come home and I knew they'd have about 10 weeks leave because they'd been mm -hmm. away so long. And then what happens after that is you go back to our unit and you all your family and friends come and everyone gets issued their medals. Yeah. So I set a goal on the first day I got to rehab that I was going to walk on that parade ground rather than get put in a wheelchair, which is yeah. what everyone thought was going to happen. And so having that focus, yeah. it, it's so powerful. Like I'd get up in the morning and my whole body alignment's changed, right? So my mm. back would be really sore to the point where I felt like it was going to snap sometimes. Jeez. And I'd have blisters on the end of my legs where I had my prosthetics on. Yeah. And they come right up into my groin. So they'd cut my groin and I'd be bleeding. And, you know, I'd have no energy to do anything. And because I'm a double above the amputee, it takes between three and 500% more energy for me to do anything. And I'd lost my dominant arm. So I was always exhausted, right? Just every day, just tired, lethargic, exhausted. But because I had that goal and I wanted to maintain those standards, especially in front of the Royal Marines, yeah. it really motivated me. Like to just put the legs on and, and keep trying to do another step every day, just improve by 1%, do a little bit more. I wasn't setting unrealistic goals at that point of, mm. you know, walking 50 miles on day one. It was just like one more step. Yeah. Wear the legs for 10 more minutes because they were really painful in the beginning. You know, now 15 minutes, now 20 minutes, now two steps more. Now th and just over the course of those weeks and months building up to the Meadows Day, just small incremental wins. Gradually, yeah. And physically... It was very hard, but I'd, I'd been there before through all sorts, you know, the yeah. Marine training, yeah. training for fights and stuff like that. But mentally, it just kept me focused and it, it stopped me sitting down going, my life's shit, my situation's shit, I don't want to do this, this isn't fair. Yeah. And it kept me out of that mindset and it just kept me driving forward. Brilliant. And then when I achieved that, I went home that night and I, I realized how powerful it was to set goals in your life. And I'd done it before, but subconsciously, like being a Marine was a goal, but I never wrote that down and went, this is it. But now I started looking at my life going, right, what's important to me? My health, fitness, family, finances, career, yeah. personal development, whatever it was, started setting goals in all these areas. 
and I never had time to sit down and feel sorry for myself because all I was doing was I was excited like yeah. let's do this let's do that let's achieve this let's, let's go right what do we have to do right I need to meet this person that person I need to make that phone call this person's going to make me better this person can help me achieve this and I just started doing all these these things to take back control of my life really? I got mentors I got people I went to America met a triple amputee I was the first one in the UK from Afghanistan yeah. So I had no one to help me in that regards. So I jumped on a plane and went to America. Got a guy that was just killing it as a triple amputee, doing incredible things. I went and spent three weeks with him. Wow. Never used a wheelchair since the 9th of June 2009 because of what him and his team taught me. Came back and started doing things like becoming a speaker. Well, yeah. I need a mentor. Someone needs to teach me and train. I need, who's the best? Who can teach me? Yeah. Perfect. Right, what's next? Oh, I want to do this sport. Right, who's the best at it? Who can teach me? You know, and that led me back to eventually jujitsu yeah. and, and all these and things. And all of this is here as yeah. well, what we're doing right now. Yeah, and I just find out who's the best at it. And I'm like, right, Bam. listen, can you help me? I just really, I respect what you do. I love what you do. You're amazing. Can you mentor me a little bit? And it's so powerful, man, having That's, those people. Honestly, it's that energy, isn't it? It's the mm. energy that you're creating. Just by, yeah, I can feel it right now, mm. sitting in front of you. That mindset you had, mm -hmm. you still got, but especially back there, I can feel it. Mm. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to yeah. do it. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. And yeah. setting everything in place. And mm -hmm. it's, it's honestly so it's awesome. great. And you were just talking, you touched upon like saying in your head, uh, improving that 1% each day. Mm -hmm. And that's something that was always, like I, I, I hear that a lot from Braulia. Uh, that was something oh, that's all, yeah, okay. yeah. He he, t he talks about it in jujitsu terms because when I go and train with him, he's like, even if you imp increase and improve that, just by turning up, being on the mats here, because sometimes you, I'm sure you get it as well. When you're on the mats, you get a bit frustrated that you can't get oh, over yes. it. Oh man, yeah. can't. and then you have to roll with it, and he can't. And then he's just smothering you, and you're thinking, mm -hmm. what's the point? What's yeah. the point? Yeah. Do you got know I me? Mean? Yeah. And he's like, he keeps he keeps referring back to that one percent increase. Yeah. You you're one percent better than what you was when you walked into this building on these mats. Then when obviously you're walking out, I was like, yeah, you got a point. And you just touched upon it there. And I was like, yeah, you got to apply that methodology in every scenario of your life. Yep. Whatever you want to do and whatever you want to achieve, mm -hmm. that's what you want to do. And with that, what is that? Obviously, you went in, you went on to do the Invictus Games. And mm -hmm. is that after coming back from America, seeing this guy absolutely smashing it in the States and then being like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. Is that how it was? Or, or was that something? Was that goal set before? Or was that? A so... I had zero interest in para sport and adaptive sport right. because of what I'd done before. I, I love competing like you guys, you know, yeah. fighting, training, not, not cause I liked fighting, but I liked to see if I had what it took to the, win against yeah. people, right? Like I think most people do, but my main goal after I was injured was to live a normal life without a wheelchair, without carers, without, you know, special hotels that I have to stay in and all that stuff yeah. that comes with with being disabled and it's funny because I had so many experiences where I'd meet people for the first time I'd shake their hand and they go so when are you training for the Paralympics then like it was a prerequisite of being disabled yeah and I hated it and I'm like I'm not interested I just want to learn to walk I want to be a full-time prosthetic user I don't want to be an athlete and actually I don't like any of the sports that are on offer yeah I don't want to run 100 meters in a straight line I don't want to do a hot whatever it was on offer yeah so I ignored it all but in 2016, I was at home and I was mapping out my goals for 2017. And I realized that Christmas Eve that year was my 10 year anniversary. So I thought, okay, what can I do now that I haven't done before, which is going to be a great way to celebrate 10 years of life. And I sat in my office and I closed my eyes and I imagined it was like a jigsaw puzzle, right? And I could see this jigsaw puzzle and I was like, right, this piece is family. This piece is career. This piece is finances. This piece is personal development. This piece is, you know, health and fitness. And the middle piece was missing. And I'm like, what is missing in my life? What haven't I done? And then I just thought it's sport, like yeah. competitive sport. And the Invictus Games was two years old. I had mm. seen my friends go out there, compete and win medals, which was awesome. But because I knew them when the cameras were off, I saw the positive impact in their lives, how they were more confident again as a person, how they were happy to interact again with their families and yeah. they wanted a career now they didn't just want to sit at home and do nothing and, and I understood to a small degree how powerful it was for yeah. them so I thought okay I'm going to apply for the Invictus Games and see what I can do now I had zero expectations because I had not done any sport before I wasn't in any of those circles or any of those cliques no one knew who I was I didn't understand how any of the sports actually even worked but I thought I'm going to give it a shot uh, I think 700 people applied 
that year and they had 72 places on the team. And you do have to trial for it. Of course. But it's not just about your ability as an athlete. There's there's a whole package, you know, are you a team player? Are you a leader? Yeah. Are you willing to do what they ask you to do? Do you put in 110%? They, they mark you on so many different things. And uh, I made it through the camps and managed to make the team in yeah. 2017. So I went out to Canada, came back with two silver medals, two bronze medals. And what they do is they'll give an award out for overall best country mm-hmm. and then overall best athlete of every country. So like right. 26 countries, thousands of athletes, there's one award. And uh, I managed to bag that award as well at the first one. Nice. Um, so I came back home and, and I was quite pleased, but my whole thing from the get-go and they always say to you it's not always about medals you know it's about like i said earlier you know can it make you a more confident person again can it help you get back on the right track and i get all that yeah but for me it was about medals and i'm like i want to turn up at these events get loads of gold medals drop the mic and go see ya and walk out (laughs) but because i didn't get any gold medals in that first year i I got home and i'm like just sat there like irritated like ah i didn't do it yeah and so my friend, he took an Invictus Games flag that I had and he took the two silvers and two bronzes and he framed them. And on the sides of the flag, he put three holes on the left and three on the right. And then he put the two silvers in the middle slot and the two bronzes in the bottom and he left the two top ones empty. And I'm like, you motherfucker, there's no way I can stare at that for the rest of my life with empty slots where gold medals should be. So I'm like, right, I'm going again. So I applied again. Went through the selection process again. Yep. Again, was was fortunate enough to make the team. Went to Australia that year and then achieved, you know, I came back with four golds that year, a silver and two bronzes. Man. But I, f- I filled those man. slots, man. I'm like, I'm man, happy now. Man, I'm good to go. That's it. Kid. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Honestly, I'm, 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 I'm feeling amazing just hearing mm. this because like, that's crazy. Your mindset is incredible. That is, it's just insane. Mm. And like, since that, you've, I know you've gone to do multiple other things, but do you tell us about jujitsu. Tell us about jujitsu. Like out of all the sports you could choose, why jujitsu? I know I mm-hmm. I can understand why, but like let the audience know why jujitsu. So, because of my background in martial arts, yeah. right? I I I started in kickboxing when I was about twelve, competing. Then I kind of progressed a little to muay thai, and I flopped in and out of the two. Then I did the boxing, yeah. but it wasn't just the combat. I liked the discipline. I liked the respect. I liked the honor and the history of it all and just feeling, you know, spiritual yeah. with it. And I, I had got back to training, you know, weightlifting and all that lot for Invictus Games, but it was like, that was, I missed that part of my life. And people had offered me before, you know, I can do karate with you, Mark, I can get you to a black belt and I can do taekwondo and get you to a black belt. And I, I just remember thinking, you can't. Mm. I can't legitimately do this because I don't have legs. I can't do the kicks. Yeah. In karate, I can't do the the katas and yeah. those things because I don't have the the appendages to do it. Yeah. But I was in the Royal Marines headquarters one day, and this this physical training instructor came up to me, and he was a purple belt at the time, and he said, "Do you want to come down to the combat room and train some jujitsu?" Now I I just thought, oh, here we go again. It's another guy promising me he can do this, but I know that he can't. But I didn't know what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was. I, okay, okay. I had tried Japanese Jiu Jitsu when I was younger, and I just Jiu-Jitsu. remember jumps, rolls, yeah. you know, rubber rubber knives and wrist locking people stood up and throwing them like judo. And I was like, I'm not going to do any of this, yeah. but I'm going to, you know, because he's a raw marine, I'm going to humor him and I'm going to go along and do it. And I went down there and he explained to me what Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was. Okay. So it's a ground based grappling system. And I don't do it with prosthetics on. So I'm sat down. I'm like, okay, well, I'm already halfway there because I'm yeah. sat. Right? Yeah. We're on the ground. So what yeah. do we do from here? And he just beat the shit out of me for an hour. right? And I remember feeling sick because I'm rolling around and my body's not used to being upside and I, I'm, yeah. I'm dizzy. And But at the end of it, you know, I'm breathing heavy and I've just had a fight with this guy. And I'm like, I love this. Like I thought this was gone from my life forever and yeah. you've given me this gift back. So I'm like, right, let's, let me ask you some questions. So we started like digging into it and I said, right, show me this technique. Can I adapt it? And he would, we would, we didn't know there was nothing set, right? We yeah. had to figure it all out as we went, but he's like, yeah, you can do this. And then I was putting like a, a cross collar choke on him or an arm bar. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, 
So this isn't going to be based on sympathy and pity. I've actually got to put the work in here. Yeah. And not only have I got to put the work in, I've got to take what 99% of people that do this sport do and then figure out how I can do it. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so exciting. Like, you know, there's a lot of stuff I can't do, but there's a lot of stuff I can do. And there's a lot of disadvantages, but there's also a lot of advantages. So like right now, I'm people get so annoyed with me. I'm I'm upside down all the time playing with their feet. And I, I don't really know what I'm doing, if I'm honest, like yeah. trying heel hooks and toe holds. But when I'm upside down, I haven't got anything they can grab. Yeah. So, so I'm like, normally you'd grab someone's foot, wouldn't you? And they're like, well, you're going to grab me. And I'm just upside down, like trying to lock them up and playing with it. I'm like, this is my advantage. And yeah. I, I need to figure out the way to use it to my most advantage to get an advantage over an able-bodied athlete. Absolutely. And, you know, it's exciting just trying to figure it all out and see what works, see what doesn't. May it open my eyes because that that time I met you for the first time at uh, Gracie Bar Birmingham mm. and I was doing a private with Bralia and you, and you rocked up. Mm -hmm. um, and Bralia started use me as a, do, as a dummy with you. And I was like, okay, cool. Let's see, let's see what we can mm -hmm. do. And then when mm -hmm. you put that, I remember you putting a cross collar choke on me. I was like, how's he going to do it? And then when he did that and he stuck me with it and he's used it, I was like, Ugh. yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then we were working the ankle locks yeah, yeah. and everything. I was like. And the esteem a lot. The, yeah, the yeah. esteem a lot. Oh, mate, mm -hmm. I still feel that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mate, it's just insane. It's just, it's like, you can, it's so true what you're saying. You can use it to your full advantage. Yeah. And the more I find out about, you know, the more I learn about Jiu Jitsu, I've only competed once, but the more I learn about it, the more I understand what you can and can't do. And so once I found out that I can literally take what's left of my right arm and I'm allowed to jab it in someone's throat, mm. I just did it everywhere. And people get so angry. They're like, they hate it because it's uncomfortable because you can, the boat is so bony. Yeah. And I'm putting it right on their throat or the side of their throat. And even if I'm not attempting a choke or a submission, it just hurts. Yeah. And they're like, get off me, get off me. Yeah. You, whether it's from the top or the bottom, I'm just driving it in. I'm like, I'm allowed to do this. And I'm driving it into, you know, I think it's called the porcupine principle uh -huh. where you take the hard part of your body to the soft part of theirs. So I'm in the ribs with this little stump and, uh, and they can't grab it. They can't arm bar it. They can't do anything can't, to no, it. Can't, <laughs> can't, do, can't do anything. No. Yes. So I'll just, you know, when it comes to defending, I'll hide my, my left arm underneath me and all they've got is this and they can't do anything with it. So it's great, you know, you figure these things out and, you know, you have a laugh and a joke yeah, about yeah. it. And yeah, it's great. It's just exciting trying to figure this whole thing out this and put the pieces of the puzzle together. And huge congratulations, because only a couple of weeks ago, you, I saw you got your purple belt as well. You yeah. just really awarded your purple belt. I did, yeah. Mate, what's that feeling like? That, oh, man. Um, now, now it's starting to get serious. Yeah. Now it's starting to get serious. I'll be honest, I went home that day and, and I've said this to Sam and everyone and, and yeah. I thought, I'm not there yet. Like, I don't okay. like anywhere. Like if someone had, I was a two stripe blue belt at the time. And if someone had given me one, potentially two stripes, I would have felt, you know, quite solid now. I'm like, yeah, okay, we're, we're there. But the whole purple thing, I was like, I don't think I'm there yet. And, and I felt a bit conflicted about it. And then I woke up the next day and I, and I kind of thought to myself, well, maybe this is the whole point. Maybe you're not supposed to feel ready so that you do what's necessary to make, make you, ready. you ready. And literally, it's only been two weeks, but I've upped my training, I've upped my, not my aggression as yeah, such, but, but my like, speed and I'm not, I'm not holding back as much. Yeah. And I'm not, because sometimes I'm a little bit like, oh, I don't want to do that. That's a bit of a dick move. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, like yeah. jabbing people in the eye, we just, not in the eye, but. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. And now I'm a bit like, no, you're allowed to do this you stuff. Do so this. I'm going to do this stuff. I've got to now drag myself up to this standard of being a purple belt. I yeah. still don't feel like I'm there yet. And it, it probably take a couple of months, but I'm training harder and smarter and, and learning more to drag myself up to where I need to be. Yeah. So I think maybe that was the whole point of it. Do you think that's down to fear? I'm sorry? Do you think that's down to fear? Because our, the reason I say that is, is because I remember having a similar feeling to that, but when I got my blue, okay. blue belt, I, obviously I was white belt for ages and I got blue belt and I was like, holy shit, I'm going to be with the big boys now. Mm. Kind of thing. And that's, how, that's how I was like. And I, similar to you, I was like, right, okay, now I've really got to up it. Because mm. I, I, I used to compete at the time MMA, but I used to do every now and again, go into a jiu-jitsu competition as a white belt. Okay. And I was like, yeah, I got this, I got this. Mm -hmm. And then I'd turn over to that mat over there and I'd be like watching some of the blue belts. And then you got some fresh blue belts, i.e. no mm -hmm. stripes. Then you got some of the blue belts that are on the verge of getting to purple. And these guys are mm. destroying mm -hmm. people. And I've always, obviously I didn't understand it at the time, but they always say the blue belt is the, 
is one of the hardest bouts that you have to maintain because that's where people are either don't continue or continue yeah. with their journey mm-hmm. in jiu-jitsu and stuff. And I remember getting the blue band. I was like, fuck, I've really got to up my training. Mm-hmm. I really got to, you know, so I started doing as much as I possibly can. Similar to you, you know, like, I, they say jiu-jitsu is a gentle art. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't feel that yeah, way yeah, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, they say it's a gentle art. But I remember like trying to be, as a work, like, trying to be as gentle as kind of, and I remember getting the blue and I was like, no, it's similar to you, fuck this. I'm going to, when I'm going to grip, I'm going to try and like ram my forearm mm. into there, into there for a really like, you know, try and do it. But when I look back at myself and I got it, I think that was all fear driven because I was scared. I was like, okay, like I was scared thinking I can't have a four strike blue belt, like, you know, in a competition who's just going to absolutely annihilate mm. me. And like, so I think that was for me personally, that was a fear driven thing. And I was just asking if that was a similar situation for you getting this. Do you think it's fear driven um, or do you think it's just. I don't know. Like, what you said there was perfect. This is what I was trying to describe earlier. I'm mm. I'm less gentle now. Yeah. Right. I I've no, almost now feel like I have to up it and and not be so gentle to be able to hang with these guys. Right. But I also feel to a degree, and I don't know whether they do or not. Like some people might hold back with me when we're when we're sparring mm. and stuff because of my situation. They might look at me and be like, oh, "I don't want to be a dick." But then I'm like, well, I'm going to make you be a dick by being less yeah. gentle with you. And I'm going to piss you off until you're like, right, fuck you, Mark. I'm yeah. go- and, and that's what I want. Do you know but, what I mean? Yeah. And you could, I'm sure you could feel that as well when someone's mm. on top of you. Because we were just talking just before we started and you were saying the other day how Sam made you feel. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's horrible, yeah, it's man. Like, but he, and he's only playing though. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But he's, I mean, he's amazing at what he does. But I think, you know, the first competition I ever did was the reorg open in Wolverhampton. It's the, the only one I've done so far. And I first, never got that, into it. That's the first reorg competition as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. And, and I never I never got into it into jujitsu to compete. I just it was teaching me so much about life and and especially life as an amputee off the mats. I was learning so much on them. It was improving my life off them. So I never wanted to compete. And uh I went into that first tournament and because I was in the power classification, they said, we've had to amalgamate some categories. You can either go with the white belts or the brown belts. And I was a blue belt. So the whole point in my mind is you want to challenge yourself, right? Mm-hmm. So I went in the brown belts against a guy called Stuart Penn from Jersey and he destroyed me. Like, but that's what I wanted. Because yeah. then, then I was like, people must be holding back because... When I've sparred in the past, you know, you slap hands, fist bump, you go into it. Stuart hit me like a hurricane and I'd never experienced it before. And all I remember from the match really is like seeing the mats. Like he just controlled my head, pushed it down, mounted me, took my bat. And I survived the whole thing, but I lost like 14 nil on points. Wow. But I was like, damn, I've not, I've not experienced that before. Like the, he was so fast and just took me to pieces. Mm. And so then when I got that this purple belt, I'm like, I need people to do that to me yeah. because I, I'd like to compete again. I'm not sure when, but I need to be prepared this yeah. time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Um, and again, the the life lessons that I learned from that was so profound. And that's what I love about it. You know, you take yeah. you take these lessons from these failures and these defeats home and you learn from them and then you come back and try and do better. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's mm-hmm. great. I think I, that's what I love. I, I, I love jiu-jitsu. I've done, I was explaining to you, like we're, I've done Muay Thai pretty much, I can't remember what age I was when mm. I started, but finding Jiu Jitsu has been, wow, it's mm. been awakening for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love the journey. With you, with you now, like obviously doing Jiu Jitsu, did you start, not start, but did you did you start Jiu Jitsu and then was it Ryog or was it Ryog and then Jiu Jitsu? How, what, which order was it in? So Ryog was a, a thing in 2017. Yeah. So Sam... Sheriff started it. At the time, he was a color sergeant in the Marines, physical training instructor. I think he started it when he was a blue belt, maybe oh, purple. Right, okay. um, and it was just for Royal Marines. Mm-hmm. And so he was everywhere he was, he would just drag people into squash courts with mats and, and train oh, with nice. them and everything. But then the, the, the maximum career, unless you get extensions in the, in the Marines is 22 years. Mm-hmm. So he was approaching his 22 year point. Oh, wow. And I'd been training with him for about a year and a half. And I'm like, what are you going to do with Reorg when you leave? He's like, I'll just give it to one of the other guys and I'll do close protection or something. And I'm like, look, mate, this has given a lot to me. Yeah. It's given a lot to the other people you set it up to help. The lads love it. 
like nobody will nurture this baby like you because it's your baby. You've got the vision for it. You know where it can go. You know who it can help. Mm -hmm. You need to kind of turn this into a charity or or something yeah. and then run it when you leave the military. And he was very uncomfortable with it. He he didn't want to do it. And, you know, me and the lads spoke and we, <laughs> I think over the course of eight, eight or nine months, we all gradually chipped away at him. Yeah. And we're like, basically Broke. trying to guilt trip him like, well, we're, we're going to suffer if you don't run this, mate, because yeah, it's yeah, just going to yeah. die. Because inevitably you hand it over to someone else who hasn't got the same passion and they get busy in life and then it ends up dying, right? So we're like, you need to take this and, and bring it into Civvy Street. And so he did. And in November 2020, so two years ago, he it incorporated as a charity. He left the, the Royal Marines, started running it as a chief exec. And it's just gone crazy. Sorry. Like Huge. we just incorporated in America like a week and a half ago. Wow. Um, all over, we're all over the UK we're in hundreds of academies now all over the yeah. world as, yeah. as an affiliate. We've helped the first year, I think Sam set out to help 10 people and right. we did 200, over 200 that we'd, we'd helped and supported with gym fees, geese, uh, whatever it may be. And it's just on this trajectory now to be huge. That's and incredible. Yeah, we we kind of branched out as well into the functional fitness world because not everybody okay. wanted to do jujitsu, um, and it's just great. And everyone, once you explain it to them, how how was sorry, how was Reorg founded? Like, what who was Sam the fa yeah. fa Sam found it all and he he founded it in 2017. Wow, because he was a rehabilitation instructor as well, so okay. he he was fixing injured Royal Marines. Right, and he took what he loved, what was jujitsu. And what he was a professional at, which was rehabilitating people, and formed it. Together. But it was just literally he was he was doing it for years as well as his day job, like just spreading the work because he loved it so much. That's so but it didn't officially in incorporate until November 2020, right? Um, and right. that's when we went out to the, the, the not what? just the Royal Marines, but all the military, yep. the emergency services, and then from the southwest of the UK to the world. Wow. Um, and that's incredible yeah and i love it you know i was i was fortunate that he asked me to be a trustee yeah and so i'm involved day to day with with the growth and it's just so exciting just to see where it is now yeah we, we, we've been to like the ufc weigh-ins ringside meeting dana and the fighters and and i'm just like wow like i'd never get to do this normally yeah i saw that picture of you and um Bradley in the in the cage in the octagon yeah yeah he's, he's, yeah, yeah he's heel hooking me yeah, in the cage yeah. after that was the first ufc back in the uk after covid yeah it was huge was man and you know you get all these incredible experiences you get to meet all these legends mm. but you also get to see people that are broken yeah and and don't know what to do and where to turn flip their life around do you know what i mean and it, I think it's a combination of being back in a community mm -hmm. that are going to support them, learning something new that forces them to grow as an individual, which is when I think human beings are at their best, when they're, when they're growing and that excites them. It gives them a purpose, a direction and a, and a positive path to walk. And you see them, and I don't say this lightly and I don't say this jokingly, you see them go from being on the brink of taking their own lives to competing in content, in competitions. like thriving and yeah, loving it yeah and that's the power of it of of sport of community yeah. and of of pushing yourself so surrounding yourself with the right people yeah and, and going on these these difficult journeys of white belt to black belt it's, yeah. it's a difficult journey yeah. like and uh i think when you share that journey with other people with a shared passion you feel part of something it's tribal yeah. no it's, it's beautiful mm. to see and uh, I, I i wasn't aware of anything about the real group until again referring back to Brialy and uh, mm -hmm. being 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 around Brialy and and I know obviously he's he he he's heavily involved with it and mm -hmm. when he was explained to me and I was like wow this is incredible what you got all of mm -hmm. you are, are doing it's amazing and yeah. you've and you got um Tom Hardy involved with it like what's that involvement how how did that come about because get Tom Hardy's no nobody he's just a big huge right. Hollywood superstar and getting yeah. him involved and now well, I'm watching him absolutely annihilate people on the mats mm. now it's just incredible like what I mean he, he like all of us loves jiu-jitsu mate yeah and Tom me myself Tom and, and Trent are the three trustees of the organization Trent's right. a purple belt who owns Elevate in Richmond um and yeah we just all all love jiu-jitsu we, like anyone who hears about Ryog's mission, we got it from mm -hmm. the get-go. Tom got it. He loves it. Um, 
he just loves training. I think, you know, that world he lives in, I can't imagine what it's like, but I think jujitsu, being on the mats, just with friends, escape. is like his Shangri-La, it's his escape and his peaceful place where he's not working, he's not doing, he's, that's, that's his time. Yeah. And I think that's why he loves it so much. That's incredible. Mm. That's so cool, man. Mm. That's cool. You guys have many spas. You know, Me and Tom, yeah. we've, had, we've had a couple, mate. We had a, uh, we we trained at the the set of Venom Two when, oh, we, when they were filming. Yeah, it was, it was awesome, mate. Like they're filming the end scene in the church, yeah, um, with Venom and Carnage, and we were at the back because it was stunt doubles doing everything. We were at the back training for two Rolling. hours. It was amazing. Yeah, just and that's the beauty of it. You can just you don't need a punch bag. You don't nah. need gloves. We had we've always got our geese with us, so we just got some stunt mats from the back and we're training just carried on well. yeah me Sam and Tom yeah, oh, brilliant. that's brilliant that's yeah, it was awesome. awesome and he he competed on the same day as you did in, in, in Wolverhampton at the first Rio yeah. comp yeah um, he came out with how many, with all golds with all, all golds. golds absolutely annihilated everyone yeah. I watched one of his matches because I, I wasn't there personally myself but I had my team there and I, they recorded one of his matches he's he's this is, this is the thing he's, he's very dominant. very good at it he's good yeah, he's, yeah. Cause he's passionate about it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, it was it was lovely to see. Like I didn't know he was turning up. No one did, I don't think. Yeah. He just kind of rocked up and was like, right, let's go. And I think he did the same thing two weeks later at another comp. Yeah, I saw just it. Just turned I up there to support pushing. somebody. You know, no one knew he was coming. All the golds. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So he's he's dominating, man. We need yeah. to see him at that. We need to see him at the worlds. Mm. That'd be awesome. Getting that would get be cool. Him, that'd, be, that'd be cool, man. Yeah. Getting winning the getting the big medals, getting that going. But there's a lot of celebrities out there, aren't there? I, I just saw, and you become aware of it now because you're in those worlds, right? And you, uh, Mario Lopez is a purple belt. Yeah, Russell he just Brand's goes... a purple belt. Dave Batista's a purple belt. Yeah. Um, I think Aston Kutcher's a brown belt. Um, Keanu Reeves is a white belt. Uh, you know, you see these people pop up on Instagram all the time. And I think they just love it too. They don't have to worry, I guess, yeah. when they're actors. You need to kind of maintain your look so you don't have to worry too much about getting Back punched end. in yeah, the face yeah, and the getting black the eyes and stuff, really, yeah. right? You got a bit of cauliflower yeah, maybe, yeah, but... Yeah. Um, That's not the end of the world, but yeah. No, I think it's just like all of us. It's it's your happy place Absolutely. where you're around great people and you're learning stuff and you can't have your phone with you and you can't worry about anything because you have to be present yeah. so you don't get choked out. <laughs> Literally. And uh, <laughs> I think that's one of the powerful things about it. You have it. to be present all the time. Mm -hmm. I love it all the time. Mm -hmm. So what's what's going what's going to be next for Rio? Have you, what's what's in sight for that? Because I saw, it's great to see that you guys what you're doing. I've seen the the clothing line you got out. I'm yeah, seeing yeah. the competitions, the tournaments that you've set. Is there is there mm -hmm. more of that happening? What's what's in sight for 2023? Yeah. So we're collaborating with a lot of big brands to help spread the message. Mm -hmm. um, we've got. I think they want to do two competitions a year now. Which is going to be great. Um, constantly fundraising and and just trying to do more and more and more and reach more and more people. So that's a that's a, like a non-stop thing. What people are always yeah. trying to bring the money in so we can carry on with the mission and provide more stuff for the people that need it. Um, and what's what's really nice about it is it just feels like loads of people are throwing opportunities at us and going would you like we've seen what you do we love it do you want to do this do you want to do that and there's an abundance of, of opportunity don't you think that comes with the, the people you're with though and you're attracting it you know the whole law of attraction it's the energy, it's the energy as isn't well, it mate, the, and what you're all because I, I again talking about like Bralia's involvement and like as soon as you could be having a bad day, you spend five minutes with him and his energy is like, oh, I like, know. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and it's exactly. like, it's like, it's, it's exactly. crazy. I, I love it. And it's like, all of a sudden from being like this, you're like, okay, yeah. all right, I'm ready. Let's yeah. go, let's go. And you're saying people are throwing stuff at you now mm. almost. But I think that's down to the people you're always surrounding yourself with, the energy you're all creating, mm -hmm. the mindset you've all got. It's, I think you're constantly attracting it. Do you, yeah. do you agree with that? Is is the people you're with? I think that makes yeah. such a huge impact because it's infectious. Like you say, yeah. And Browley, it was like the personification of of infectious enthusiasm. When you're around him, it, your energy just goes through the roof. Yeah, you know, and people want to be around people like that because it makes them feel good and it makes them do better and it makes them a better person. Absolutely. And because we've got so many people like that around us, it, it draws people in. And they're like, "What is this? <laughs> oh, okay, right." So you do this, oh, you're helping veterans. Oh, that's really good. And what is jujitsu? Oh, and, and this is what you're going to do next year. And they're like, how do I be part of it? Yeah. And then it's amazing. It's awesome. How, mm. how did Briley come about uh, being part of Real? Was that through you or was that through Sam? Or? No. It, or it, was... this, 
was ninety nine percent of this is, has been driven by Sam, like oh, from wow. back in two thousand seventeen, because he's he's a guy right that just does things. Like he was, a lot of us, me included, will have a great idea, but then because of fear, you'd be like, oh, maybe I shouldn't. He'll just yeah. do it, and he'll reach out to people like Braulio and and Roger Gracie and Tom and all these people, and tell them, and then they're on board. Nice. It's it's nuts. Like. He just does things. And the prime example of this is, you know, we were at the Arnold Schwarzenegger Fitness Festival. Uh, uh, the in the NEC. In the NEC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was our second year. And he had managed to get me a speaking slot on, the, there's two stages. There's the inspiration stage, which is yeah. in the middle of the arena. Then there's the hero stage, which is where the celebrities are. So he got me three one-hour speaking slots on the inspiration stage. Then all of a sudden, the day we turn up, we realize you've got, Paddy the Baddy, you've got Ronnie Coleman, you've got Michael Bisping, you've got Tia Claire Toomey and Matt Fraser and all these celebrities in, in the athlete world that are going to be on these stages. So we went to the organizers and we managed to hijack five minutes before everybody spoke. It was exhausting. Like we were running from stage to stage to stage for three days and we told them about Reorg. Like thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Now I, I could have had the idea but I may not have executed on it. Yeah. He had the idea and he's gone. And and before you've blinked, it's happening. And I'm like, this is impressive. Like the way he just sees it, sees the vision, sees what it can be and makes it happen is another reason why people I think are so drawn to it That's and why it's been so successful. That is incredible. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And you're talking about speaking, going on stage. And mm -hmm. I know obviously it's, you, we, we're going back, uh, going back a few years now, but what there's going to be, I'm sure you probably get inundated with Instagram mm. messages, with phone calls, emails, and all sorts of people going out and people, people trying to get advice from you, people you setting out to help people and obviously them surrounding themselves with great minded people like yourselves. What gave you the idea of going out on stage and being like, right, this is what I need to do and I need to voice it out and, and, and help people like that? How did, how is that? Because I can imagine that in itself is quite daunting being in a crowd being on stage in front of a crowd like that, mm. how, how you find them doing all that side of it. Cause that, that in itself is something else as well. You got to get yeah. yourself mentally prepared for it as well. I mean, I, I never set out to do any of this. It was literally years and years and years ago when I was first injured, I got asked to do like a 20 minute talk on my story for a charity. And oh. my whole mindset then was like, no one's going to want to hear that. It's boring. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's just a military thing. You're like, you could you could get win a Victoria Cross, right? Which is the highest honor for bravery you can get in the military. Yeah. And around the lads, when you start talking, they're like, "Yeah, you're boring. Be quiet." And just, just like in a bantery <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you kind of have this humility of like, well, you know, I've, I might have done some cool stuff, but you know, we don't really talk about it. Yeah. And they asked me to do this talk, and I did it, and I really enjoyed it. And I, I thought I was going to be super nervous, but I wasn't. And then I got lots of cool feedback from it. And okay. then through social media over the years. You know, stuff I've done in the media, people have said, you know, I saw you do this and this changed my perspective on this. And and I kind of thought, well, the more people that I share the story with, the more positive change that I can have. So I started going out there and speaking on stages. You know, I came from a talk last night. I was yeah. 20 minutes away from here doing a talk last night. Um, and I'm actually building a, an evening with kind of show now, which we're going to launch in February oh, next nice. year. And uh you know, it's not an ego thing. It's just, it's really nice when you get those messages from people saying, I didn't know about your story. These were my struggles. You helped me put it in perspective. And now I'm doing this. Yeah. You know, and so I want to get into doing books and, and some more TV stuff and documentaries. And I'd like to write some kids books oh, and it, implant some messages about. Be yeah, you know, that's a great idea. That's yeah, like lessons that I've learned when, yeah. as, as a grown up, but said through myself as a 12 year old, maybe, you know, that kids can learn from. Um, so those are all the things that I want to do. It's just trying to figure out, put, getting to know the right people, putting yeah. the right pieces in place. And, you know, I know where I want to take things. We just, like we said earlier, 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent gains. Constantly 1% mm -hmm. increasing every time. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you know the history of, of me doing these podcasts, but I started these podcasts in the pan like, around mm -hmm. the lockdown when we were locked down I was similar to you uh, thinking you know when you kind of like start writing goals out and thinking of what you want to do to achieve and stuff like this so I got hold of Manny and Manny got hold of me and we kind of like connected and we're like I really want to start doing these podcasts because I was like, 
obviously during the time of the pandemic and mm-hmm. COVID, there's a lot of people mentally suffering with their mental health. And yep. I was like, man, I'm, I know a lot of great people because a lot of my, co- I see my coaches as these big superheroes mm-hmm. and I know that they, I know what they've done for me. Uh, it all started off with getting them on and getting them talking and getting them to obviously advise all our listeners out there and the people that watch these podcasts to obviously, you know, inspire them and obviously get them to feel good about themselves and go out there and, you know, make the world, the world is their oyster, like, you know, make them dream big and, and reach out. And as the more guests I keep having, there, there's, I'm learning a lot. I've okay. learned so much from you today. Oh, thank you. And the feedback I always get is, is that, this person has helped me do this. This person's helped me do this simply because of just listening and, and hearing their story. What advice would you give the people out there that are listening to this podcast right now? Because for me, you're one of the strongest people I've ever met, both physically, mentally, like with your mindset that you want to start in way back when you first went into the Royal Marines mm-hmm. of that tunnel vision of this is what I want to do. There's no plan B. Mm-hmm. This is me. This is what I'm going to go and do it. What advice would you be giving out to the listeners today listening about your their mental health and just going out and pursuing it? I would say get more people, tell as many people as you can to listen to content like this. Right, and I don't want to go down a rabbit hole with this because no, it's no, not no. my vibe anymore, but th- there's so much negativity out there on mainstream TV, on social media. And I think a lot of people don't even understand how much they're taking on board subconsciously day by day but once you understand it and you can do something about it you cut all that rubbish out your life because it has such a negative effect on people's mental health you know the cost of living covid war financial crisis and all this stuff like it's going to happen no matter what you don't need to be listening about it every day yeah replace it with stuff like this positive empowering motivating inspiring the content that's going to make you feel good yeah then it's going to make you do good and we said about it earlier that the more you feel like that and you put that energy out there the more that kind of stuff you attract to yourself yeah so read the right books listen to the right podcast follow the right kind of social media get rid of all the junk and guff and rubbish and you'll realize actually how much shit you actually consume on a daily basis it's irrelevant and it makes you angry get rid of it all focus on the good stuff do it consciously and your mental health just changes it changes that's that's incredible Mm. no 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 thank you so much mark honestly i really really appreciate you taking the time out your hectic (laughs) diary schedule and that you've got going up and down the country like you do so i appreciate you taking the time out i've learned so much from today i can't wait out I can't wait to go and challenge myself the way you've just done there and, yep. and go out and achieve it. So thank you so much. For thank coming you, down mate. And having us down. So appreciate, appreciate it, brother. Thank you. Respect. Thank you.